I'm reading from John 1, 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was made was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the child, uh, become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision nor of husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you, Jamin. I so appreciate our youth. Um, and the way they're plugging in to the things of God. You might think that that's a little bit aside from the Christmas story. I, I had it read. Jamin did a great job on Christmas Eve as well. And I refrained from preaching. Made it a little bit shorter service. But I want to share that sermon, which I had already written. I want to share that with you today. Because the story of Christmas is the story that began even before the creation of all that we see. The Bible says that the plan of salvation was in God's mind from before the creation of the world. And it's a little bit difficult to understand from a, from a religious point of view, from, from a rational point of view, it's hard to understand for me why the world is what it is why things work the way they do but this text is uh it's a story that talks about god's order and you to to hear it read you wonder how the Word became flesh. Well, have you ever stopped to think that everything that we see was created at the voice of God? And that Word, that spoken Word that put everything into existence is that same Word that was sent by the Father as a babe in a manger. It's something that, um, something that man has always tried to understand, and yet with the rational mind, we can't do that. I'll tell you what the rational mind does. The, the expression that God is a God of order. Have you ever heard that? That expression was actually created by good, good people. It was well-meaning. Um, but God is both a God of order and a God of chaos. And if you think I'm not speaking from the Bible with that, if you look at Genesis 1 and 2, starting with Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then it talks about the earth as being without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. That chaos was created by God. That chaos was there. But then God is also, he's a God of chaos and a God of order. 
And so God said, let there be light. And if we trust that God is the God of everything, then we'll begin to understand that God is more than we can understand. Because even the darkness, John said, even the darkness can't overcome the Word of God. The darkness couldn't comprehend it, could not reach into it. But neither can the created light, because the true light is the light that's come into the world. The true light is the Word of God. And, and I don't mean to go too deep theologically and go off onto something that is not directly applicable to our lives. I just want you to think about that, and as you consider the way things work, the brokenness of this world, versus the hope that we talk about, as you consider that strange difference, then consider that God is also the God, the God of chaos. You see, the scientific age that came into the world said God is the God of order. And that was, it was a good thing for mankind in a lot of ways because it sparked a lot of science, the scientific method, the scientific rev revolution. But it didn't bring order to our world. Man's best efforts brought an industrial revolution which brought education without morality it brought civilization without peace people opted, lived in the country up until the industrial revolution and within a hundred years it went from 90 percent living rural to almost 90 percent living in cities that happened first in Europe, and now within the last century, it's happened here in Canada until this hick finally moved to a town. But you know that it also brought wealth because as the industrial age entered, people were able to do things on a grander scale. And wealth didn't create peace or joy. The Industrial Revolution brought greater weapons, brought stronger borders, but it didn't bring security, and it didn't bring world peace. Because our best efforts, our best order, falls short of God's order. The best thing that mankind can do on his own misses what God wants to bring into the world. And that's why this first 14 verses of the book of John is a different story of Christmas than you see in Luke. It's the same story. The story of how God, the Word of God, stepped into time and took on flesh. Because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was there with God. The Word was God, co-equal with God. We understand Him now since he came as a man, we call him the Son. But before time, before he took on flesh, he was the Word of God. The interesting thing was that in the mind of God was the plan to create what we see around us. And so the world was created. And then the Holy Spirit or the Spirit hovered on the waters and order began to take place. And as the Spirit hovered, the Word spoke. God spoke and said, let there be light. And then we see the days of creation happen. And then God did one final great act of creation. Created man and then woman because men shouldn't be alone. But with the ability, man was created not just as an animal, with instincts, with programming, with a be what you want to be kind of nature, be what you're created to be. But man was created with a be what you want to be kind of nature. We were created with choices. The hard part of that creation 
was that the human tendency is to want to be like God. The human tendency is to choose and to not always choose the right thing. We were created in the image of God, and so we want to make choices that are on our own, separate to God. It didn't take a whole lot of temptation for Eve and then Adam to turn away from God. In fact, Eve said, here, eat this. He didn't even ask the question, sure, let's try it. If you think Eve got in trouble, he just walked into it. It's a little bit different than you might have heard that preached, but read it again. But the word was still willing to speak into this broken world, the world that we broke by wrong choices. Because the word being the true order that could come into the world, the order that God wants to give into this world, stepped into the very flesh that we live in and showed that living God's way is the right way. Choosing God's way is the right way. See, God chose to punish his perfect son, that representative man, for the brokenness that we live, for the separation between mankind and God. He put all that separation. All that would divide man from God was placed on him and said, own it. And Jesus said from the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why? Even a perfect man couldn't understand why that had been chosen. Why he had been chosen to carry that. But it was the only way because out of the infinite chaos of wrong choices came the perfect sacrifice to make up the difference. The infinite possibilities of wrong choices in mankind was now given the choice to freely come to the Son of God. Not to live out the brokenness and the wrong choices and the consequences of the wrong choices that we make, but the freedom to walk into God's order, into God's way. That is the light that's coming into the world. A light that the darkness couldn't overcome. The darkness of our brokenness and wrong choices. You see, the Spirit still hovers over this earth and calls since the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, after Christ's resurrection and returning to the Father, he said, I'm going back to the Father so that the Spirit can come. And the Spirit came, and the age of the Holy Spirit is now. The Holy Spirit is calling to every individual. So when we look out around this community and see our young adults in the brokenness of addiction, it's too real to not talk about it's too broken to not do something about. We need to step into that world with the light and the truth of God's word and tell them there's a better way. I picked up a hitchhiker this summer. Had the opportunity to pick him up quite a few times. And I can tell you that as I prayed for that young man, the last time I talked to him about a, a week before lobster season, he had been in church three weeks out of four. From a life of partying and going his own way to following after God's way. Can you imagine what grandmother's heart feels about that? Haven't met her yet, but I can tell you a million things she's probably thought since then. That is what the light brings into the world. It brings young people into finding a better way. And it's the only way to live. I can tell you that there's only one way to get into that world, though. The only way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes into that world of order except through me. And the word that became flesh and lived among us 
provided a perfect way simply by turning our will, surrendering our way to God's way, we can become a part of his world. But you have to give up the right to control. And if you want to go on trying to control your world, your way, you will end up with the same results. And that insanity is the only thing that can keep us out of heaven. The insanity to want to control something that we never can control. The insanity to try to do better. The insanity to try to work out a rational way to live better. I've had so many conversations with super intelligent people who felt that more education would make this world better. If we were only educated, if we could only teach people how to do better, education makes better weapons to kill each other. Don't ever forget it. That's what the Industrial Revolution did. That's what the Intelligence Revolution did. And what used to be just weapons in hands now has become software programs that can run entire weapons arrays. And we live in a world where more education hasn't made it more secure. And some of the, some of the worst... Some of the worst outcomes that we've ever seen in history are taking place in our world around us today. And yet if we're willing to accept God's control in our life, if we're willing to step out of our hope, out of our hopelessness rather, into his world, if we're willing to make right whatever we messed up in relationships with other people, I didn't say if we're willing to do it, I said if we're willing to try. In other words, if I offended someone, if I've hurt someone, I have to be willing to try to make it right. It's not my responsibility to make it right, it's my responsibility to ask forgiveness. It's not my responsibility to make someone better, it's my responsibility to forgive them no matter what they've done to me. And if we can come to a place where we forgive the worst enemy that we've ever had, someone who has hurt us over and over and over, someone maybe who can never fix what they've broken in our world, that act of forgiveness is asking God to take over. Does it say that what they did is okay? No. Does it say we want them to act like that again? No. Does it stop them from behaving like that again? No. But it frees us to accept God's order in our life. And God's order is an order of light that darkness cannot overcome. And there is no darkness, there is no horror that we can ever live in this world that God cannot set us free from. I've experienced a few, both personally and second-handed as a pastor. I've seen some horrors that I never want to see happen. I can tell you what, I cried this morning when I talked to Wilbert. I cried with him. How much I would love Lucille to get better and sass me for the next 20 years. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> but someday forever in heaven, we're going to have fun. And whatever happens in this world order, we can leave in God's hands. We can trust that someday he'll make everything right if we surrender to his will so that we can be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. I'm quoting the words of a prayer that you might know the first part of. That prayer starts out with, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I'm going to pray that for you guys now. And we're going to pray over the food. But if anyone's here that has not surrendered their entire life, whatever they've lived, to God's order, 
I'm praying for you. And I've prayed as I wrote this sermon. And we'll be praying that you can turn it all over to his order. That he will bring order in the chaos of your world. That he will bring peace in the upheaval that the enemy has brought into your world. And if you're willing to give everything to him, whether maybe you're a Christian that has lived some things that no human being should ever live, but if you ask the Holy Spirit to hover, he will bring light and life into your darkness no matter what it is. And I can tell you that God is moving on this island. The money that was raised in the last week, almost, or in the last few weeks by the churches here on the South Shore going into benevolent works was almost $60,000. There was a church in Moncton, Moncton Wesleyan, that they gathered up over $106,000. And as of the next two or three weeks, there's going to be 14 more beds where homeless people don't have to live in a tent in minus 20 weather or colder. There's people living in the park not very far from Moncton Wesleyan. And they said, enough. Let's do this. They didn't do it. And if you watch online on Facebook, you'll hear Joel Gorbett's prayer. And if you know Joel, Joel like even as much as I do, we've had a few conversations. And I can tell you that Joel did none of that for show. He called his people to make a difference in the city of Moncton, to bring light into darkness, to bring hope into hopelessness. And I can tell you, I read in the paper some of the stories of some of the people that were living on the street, people that were working hard for a living and fell through the cracks of the system and had nowhere to go. And so they built a shelter in the park, not even as far as the boat shop is from this church, from Moncton Wesleyan. People living in the cold. The question is, will we look beyond our doors? Will we make a difference in this world together? Not for show, but to make a difference. So let's pray together. Let's work together. Let's reach together. And to bring hope into that world. But I'm going to pray now for us. And if there's anyone here, as we pray, please turn anything and everything over to God. Let him bring light and life into your world. And I can tell you that there will be joy that you cannot contain, that you will have to share with this world. Can we pray? Let's stand together. Father God, I'm so thankful for this combined service today, for the children that were able to come and to share um, and sing and talk about the love that came into the world. Thank you for the time that we had to share and, and sing carols hymns of praise and joy for a baby that came into the world. Help us never to forget that that baby that came into the world is the Word of God who took on flesh and brought hope into our dark world. And Father, even as people live through difficulties, we pray again for Wilbert. Help him not to lose hope. Help him to fix his eyes on the hope and the light of the world. And Father, as we share in the joy of this meal, I pray that you bless the food and bless our time together. But Father, grant us this week, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference, and to leave the things we can't change in your hands, your capable hands, Help us to live one day at a time, to enjoy one moment at a time. Help us to accept hardship as the pathway to peace. Help us to take, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is and never stop loving, never stop caring, never stop hoping in God who can redeem us. And Father, I'm so thankful that even on the cross, as a man, he quoted Psalms, where the end result is trust in you. Thank you that we can, as human beings, lean on your Holy Spirit and trust in you and never give up hope. And help us to trust for one day when you'll make everything right and to surrender to your will 
so that we can be reasonably happy here in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You're dismissed. Let's enjoy lunch together. God bless.